Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Don't worry. It's okay. I'll always be with you. Jenkins calling. Uh, I tried to get you early, but I'm going to leave you this voicemail. Just need to let you know Death Stranding is out, and I need you to go out and get it. It is going to be the biggest thing. So uh, let me know you got this voicemail as soon as possible. On the line, we have Tommy L. Jenkins talking to us. From where are you talking to us from, Tommy? I am in Los Angeles, sunny LA, man. Is it good? Is it good weather? It is. It's absolutely gorgeous today. I'm sitting in my up in my loft with a view of the Burbank Mountains on one side and the Hollywood Hills on the other. Uh, it's a cloudless sky, and I couldn't be happier on this sort of what would normally be uh, a frosty November day. <laughs> You're trying to rub it in, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> not really. Not really, no. It's freezing here, Tommy. Is it? Yeah. So are you are you in London? No, Leicester, but it's still freezing. You're in Leicester. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine it is pretty cold. I was just in London uh, not that long ago, maybe about two, three weeks ago, and it wasn't that bad, but it was typical grey, slightly grim London, but still somehow beautiful. I don't know how it manages that, but there you go. <laughs> well, I'm going to shock everybody now. I have never interviewed an actor on the release of a Hideo Kojima game. This is a first for me, because it's only come out since last Friday. Correct, yes. <laughs> and this is Tuesday now, and obviously people are starting to play through it, they're starting to do videos on it, the reviews are coming out, which are pretty favourable. Yeah. I've got to ask the obvious question now, Tommy. <laughs> Sorry to do this to you. What was production of the game like for you? Uh, I'll tell you, you know, it, it was an incredible experience. I'm not an avid gamer. I like video games, but I don't really play. I work a lot on them. I do a lot of, obviously, a lot of voice work uh, and stuff for video games. And it was the most incredible experience for me. One, because it was uh, ticking a box because I hadn't done motion capture before. So that was one of the things. And then secondly, was working with Hideo, who I wasn't funny enough, aware of, and then I realized who he was, which was probably a good thing because I didn't feel, you know, overly intimidated by anything or anything like that, or I was nervous. It was really working with this, you know, this very interesting director who had a translator, and basically it was about bringing his vision to life, and that was all my focus. My focus was really just that, and I enjoyed that process very much as an actor, you know, just working with him and trying to, you know, get through the dialogue which was plenty. It was a bountiful amount of uh, dialogue for me. You know, but he was incredibly gracious. He was very hands-on. I couldn't have asked for a better experience working on it. It was pretty incredible. And obviously working with people like Mads Mikkelsen and uh, Norman Reedus, Lindsay Wagner and Troy and, and, and others. But uh, mainly I had a lot to do with Mads and Norman. I would put it out there now that Hideo Kojima is one of the best gaming directors of our generation. Easily, quite easily. He's like the, the James Cameron or the Spielberg of, of video games. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He has an incredible passion for what he does in his storytelling and you know his process and trying to break boundaries and all of those things. You know, And I think that's kind of what Death Stranding does. It's a, it's a new type of interactive game. Uh, compared to things in the past, you know, and, and like, like everything, you know, it might not be everyone's cup of tea, but there will be an incredible amount of people who are so open to something like this, this whole open world game, 
you know, and I, and I think he's done a phenomenal job at it, regardless of, you know, if you're a, a Hideo Kojima fan or not. I think anyone who sees it will look at it and kind of go, well, you, you can't deny the, the, the quality of it and the technology and, you know, his story behind everything. You know, I think he's got some very interesting characters, interesting character names, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a little crazy, but I think you just have to let yourself be open to that. Sorry about this, Tommy. I'm going to have to talk about it. Mocap. Right. I'm looking at photos of you on IMDb. Yes. And I'm just thinking, you don't immediately strike me as a person who would wear all the Velcro and the dots and the... <laughs> it's, not, it's not my most attractive look. <laughs> Let me be clear. Yeah, that was interesting because, like I said, I'd never done mocap. I knew what it was and I kind of knew what it entailed. But you do have to climb into these little onesies uh, with Velcro balls all over you. And, you know, you've got these gloves. You know, there's a whole process in which you go physically to do when you stand in front of the camera, beginning with what they call a T-pose and ending with the T-pose. It was a very interesting thing. And with the headgear and then you've got the camera, which is, looks like a huge, you know, microphone, which it is. And then there's a camera there as well. So you've got all of this stuff to, to also deal with whilst you're acting in a scene. So it was, it was definitely challenging. Definitely challenging. For an obvious sort of actor like yourself, who's obviously done film and TV, was it difficult sort of acting to nothing? For me, there wasn't a moment where I didn't feel like I was acting to nothing without giving anything away. I think scenes that I'd worked with, you know, having the other person there was enough. I have done those those moments where there was a little moments where you, there might not be anything. You have to kind of imagine certain things there. But, you know, I think part of that as the actor, it is difficult and it is a challenge. But I think as long as we have the, the intention the dialogue and the story that we're trying to tell, we as the actor have to dig a little deeper in in some aspects more than others for things like that. You know, and I know a lot of people who, you know, things like working on green screen and having to, to act to, say, a dragon that's not there, for instance, you know, or another person who's not there. And then they give you a tennis ball on a stick to look at. But, you know, we do, we have to really dig deep and, go to that world of our imagination where we we have to convey all of those emotions without sometimes nothing there and once again it's just another challenge as an actor in in, in that sort of uh in that medium i mean obviously i've spoken to quite a lot of people some first timers some seasoned vets of mocap and they've always described it as a bit like uh theater would you sort of agree with that very much so yes it's like a, a theatrical playground uh, in some ways, because it is filming it like a movie, because you are on a soundstage, you have your your set mapped out, you have remnants of, of set pieces that have been built, and props, all of which have dots and little balls on them so that they can be picked up on the computer, and it is working in a, in a sort of a, in a 360 degree set where you can move and turn any way you want to without necessarily worrying about having to face a camera because the camera is always with you, you know, on your headgear. So it always will find you. So you, you do have, a, in some ways, I think you have a lot of freedom as, as the actor to move about and, and do whatever it is because it's going to capture everything, everything. Nothing will be missed. Here's a dangerous question, Tommy. Uh-oh, watch out. Yeah. <laughs> VR is a new thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you know. Would you say they missed a trick by not putting VR in, in the game? I don't think so. No? No. I haven't played the game yet, which I'm, I'm still going to do. From everyone that I know who has played and is currently playing, I don't think anyone's missing anything. I, th I think there has been enough given to them at this particular moment in time. I don't think that the not having the VR section is is something that, that makes it uh, anything less or that they've necessarily missed out on. Maybe in some respects you don't want to, you know, overdo it. 
you know, by adding too many things. And maybe adding that might be something that might be, oh, that could have been left to be something else. I don't know that it would necessarily have enhanced the the experience of Death Stranding if it was VR or not. I don't really know the, the answer to that question. But at this moment, from what I'm gathering, is that no one is missing that aspect. And funny enough, I don't think anyone's brought that aspect up, as far as I know, and certainly not to the people who've been responding to me on social media. That has never... That's never come up. So it was an interesting question. Dangerous, possibly. (laughs) But no, I think it was certainly a valid question to ask. But I don't think that the game misses anything by not having that. Obviously, you mentioned that you've still got to play it. That's fine. You're obviously getting the fan mail. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine when it was released, you're sort of looking at your phone and you're thinking, oh, God, there's 250 Twitter notifications. And you're thinking, where are they coming from? (laughs) Yeah. You know, my Twitter blew up when it when it came out. It blew up for me personally when I think back in 2018, maybe it was September, when my character was actually announced who I was and what character I was playing. And I think that was at the Tokyo Games show that that was actually announced. And from that moment on, it, it started to sort of go a, a little crazy. Then it would die down. And every time there was a moment of something being released, you know, a new trailer or, you know, the mention of uh, my character, which seemed to be shrouded in so much mystery because of, of his look uh, and what was going on. And there was not a great deal of information about, about him being shared, you know, just a little bit at a time. When the game and everything was released... I think that was when, you know, it all kind of really started to blow up and sort of getting, you know, notifications, you know, congratulations and how excited people were. And, you know, it's been wonderful. I have to say I've I've been incredibly honored with the responses of people, you know, talking about the game, my performance in the game. and, And it's just been really nice and it's all been incredibly positive. So, you know, I'm very appreciative of that. As someone who has probably had to go through not talking about it for I don't know, a year or so, maybe even longer. Mm. When it gets to the final release and, and it gets released and they're going, it's out in game or HMV or wherever, is it kind of like, oh, thank God for that, I can talk about it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things that, you know, we are, we're often, as actors, I think, involved in projects that require an NDA and, you know, and you can't speak about anything about it, you know, until it's released or this, that, and the other. And even, and even after that, you know, even with Death Stranding at this point, I'm still very careful about what I say because I am relieved that it's out because it has been quite a long journey. And I know that it's been something that's ongoing even before my involvement with the game. So I think it's going back about three years, maybe, mm. if not longer, where people knew about it and it was sort of put out there that, that it was coming. And it is very difficult to, to kind of keep quiet about certain things because you, you, you do become excited about it. But there's also the element that's quite rewarding that you don't say anything about it until it's out. And then you kind of get this explosion from people who are just so elated that it's finally coming. And I think I remember when they announced back in May of 2019, I think it was, they announced the release date, which was going to be November 8th everyone seemed to have lost their mind they were so excited that a date was actually set in stone where it was actually going to happen because no one knew for years when it was going to come and they've just been patiently waiting for it to happen and when it did it just it really blew up so you know trying to keep things quiet over a long period of time can be difficult but it's also quite rewarding at the end when you can talk about it and like i said even now i have to still remain very careful about what i say so that there's nothing spoiled no. uh with regards to the game mm. and the story obviously we need to talk about working with the cast and crew on set mm-hmm. obviously matt mickelson yes i mean <laughs> where do you even start with matt mickelson <laughs> i mean you've got you've got bonds you've got um hannibal <laughs> oh, listen, Matt is is an incredible actor and a human being. I had such a great time chatting and talking with him on set and, you know, and kind of having bonding moments and really working together to flesh out our scenes. You know, I think it was new for him as well. Uh, I don't think he was aware of Kojima when he was approached to, to come on board with, with the game. 
I think his son, he said his son, he wrote in an article uh, interview once, I think that his his son was more excited about the fact that he was going to, because his son is a gamer, uh, and his son was absolutely over the moon that he's going to be working with, with Hideo Kojima. And he's like, he didn't care about the films that I'd done, but he was more excited that I was actually going to be working with Hideo Kojima, which I think is absolutely hysterical, you know, because Matt is a brilliant actor, brilliant. And like I said, a, a really cool guy to, to be around and, and work with. And we both come from similar backgrounds as dancers as well, believe it or not. So that's very interesting. There's no deleted scene, is there? <laughs> <laughs> with Matt and I doing some sort of pas de deux somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> And then, of course, you've got Norman Reedus, who's obviously known for Walking Dead. Yes, who is also the coolest guy ever. Very easygoing, and I love that. I love working with actors who have no pretension about them in terms of, you know, we're, we're all here to do the same job. We're all here to make the same product and get the same result and all of that. And we have a mutual respect for each other and their craft and their 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 art form their way of working everything you know and it was wonderful to just be on set with these guys and feel exactly that you know we're all on the same page and let's just do this and have fun in the process and and make a good game so obviously i do have to ask this question and please 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 tell me don't give out any spoilers with this one are there any sort of funny anecdotes you can share about the production of the game any funny anecdotes? No, I can't because anything that is funny might spoil story. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything specifically, any funny anecdotes. No, I think the only thing, if I think about anything that's, that's funny, would be moments of, of motion capture where we are... Uh, having to, to, to work with things that aren't there. And sometimes you, you'll walk to a certain point possibly and you realize, oh, I've just walked through a wall. And, <laughs> and you have to stop and realize, okay, I need to put a mark down for that because I've literally just gone through a brick wall somewhere here. But other than that, I don't want to, to say anything that would potentially even be a spoiler because I realize that everything you say in this world and the people who follow this world of gaming will read and dissect every little thing you say to find out information that might be leading to something. So I do try to be incredibly careful about that. <laughs> Did you hear him? He's walked into a wall. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly my point. <laughs> I do have one thing. It's not really a spoiler, but we can talk about it anyway. Because obviously we've talked about Norman and, and Mads, which is fine, and they're yeah. huge A-class actors in, in the world of yes. film and TV. One of yes. the interesting cast, cast in this project as well is Troy Baker. Yes. So I, I know him outside of all of that as well, and it's the first, it's the first time we've been on a project together. And Troy which I'm sure everyone knows, is sort of synonymous in, 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 the, in the gaming world. He's done loads, loads, loads of stuff and is also incredibly good at, at what he does. And obviously his character, he plays Higgs, and he is really, really cool. I have a lot of respect for him, his talent and his work ethic. And once again, like everyone else, we all get along very well. Very well. I was just in a, in New York with him. We did the uh, the Fractured Worlds uh, into Death Stranding, the World of Death Stranding launch in New York this past week. And uh, he and I got to hang out uh, with Lindsay Wagner and Norman. Uh, the four of us were there, and it was great. You know, it was the first time we'd all kind of been back together since we all wrapped on the, on the project. So it was nice to sort of have that celebratory moment and just enjoy the the game being about to be released at that point so it hadn't been yet it was a few days later obviously mads and norman are a-class actors film and television i would yes. go so far to say troy baker is an a-list actor in video games 100 percent, 100 percent. yes yes I would agree with that. Mm. And the amount of love he, he spends with the fans at Comic-Cons. I mean, I've gone to Comic-Cons and he's there. 
he has lots of projects that he does, and I think he does like a, a podcast and webcasts, and I think he has a, a series that he does, and always working on on other projects and stuff outside of the gaming thing as well, and creating his own content. I do believe, and he is very much a hands on person who enjoys talking to to the fans and people who support you know the work that he does. And I think, and I think that's only fair. I think we as as artists owe that to those people who are so committed to the work that we've done and who want to share their views and their thoughts. And I think it's it's just a way of staying in touch because without those people, you don't really have a a project or you don't really have the you know the support. Uh, and it's nice to sort of be in touch with them and and hear what they have to say and. And just take some of that stuff on board. Well, let's talk a bit about you, Tommy. You yourself. <laughs> me, myself. What would you like to know about mm. me? What made you want to get into the industry in the first place? I have been in the industry since I was a kid. Since I was 14, I started my first professional theatre job in a summer program. And ever since then, I've sort of been involved in the industry in some form or another, whether that was singing or whether it was dancing or whether it was acting in theater you know so i've kind of always been associated with it uh as 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 the years have gone on i've sort of you know dibbled and dabbled into various other aspects of it you know uh, of the entertainment industry and when i say the entertainment industry i do include every aspect of that you know i was a sort of euro pop star at one point in my life uh in europe and then you know i modeled for a bit I've done Broadway. I've been on the West End of London for many years. And, you know, and London is like my second home. I've spent more than half my life living in London. And I only just moved back to L.A. in 2014. But I go back and forth because, obviously, I, I'm also the voice of Ubercorn, the, <laughs> the funky unicorn from a TV series called Go Jetters. So I do still do a lot of work on that. And it's just done it completed its third season there. So, you know, I... I think it's always been within me to be in some form of entertainment. The TV and film aspect obviously came a little bit later where it was much more consistent. And and the video game situation, I've always done a lot of voice. I'm a voice artist as well, so I do a lot of voiceover work. Uh, And those things just kind of start to to open little doors. You do one project and you work with one specific director and then they tell you about someone else or you hear about that. And and it does become a slightly knock-on effect, but then you start to build, like anything, you start to build a a name for yourself uh, and you start to get more work. But at the end of the day, I still have to do the typical thing where I have to audition for projects that I want to do. Uh, You know, very rare... Uh, at this point, do I still get you know a call to say, listen, I've got this job. If you're happy to do it, I'd want you to be a part of it. It does happen. For the most part, there are still things that I have to, you know, I still have to rise and grind, man. You know, I do enjoy going after something and 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 getting it and seizing that moment and you know giving everything I can to to get that particular role or whatever, you know, and hopefully move forward with that particular project. So it's always been a part of my life where every day is what's going to happen today? What will be there? What what audition will come through or what project's going to surface? So, you know, I, I live in a, in a world that is, I don't know what, what each day is going to bring. And I kind of like that, you know, I don't have to get up every day knowing from nine to five that I I have to do the same thing every day. Sometimes I wish I could because the security is, a, is a certainly a lot, is far better uh, in that respect. And there is there is that. But ultimately, I I live my days kind of going, ooh, wonder what's going to happen this week or next week or tomorrow. It's the, it's the unknown. And I think there's something very exciting about that once you get used to it. It's not for everybody, believe me. It's not for everybody. I just wanted to go on for minute or so about your uk based stuff because i just had a quick look and this this was just sort of death stranding and this makes no sort of connection to me <laughs> you've done the royal variety performance yes and i think i've done it a couple times it's a british institution it was a defining point for me to just be able to sort of stand on that stage and and go oh my god i'm i'm, I'm at the royal variety this is crazy this is amazing you know, and working in, in the West End, some of the shows get invited to perform in front of the, the royal family. And it was amazing. 
you know, it was just nice to sort of tick that off a, off a list, you know, and I, I still have got, got quite a long list. Uh, so I'm slowly but surely ticking certain things off a bit. Uh, and performing at the Royal Variety was one of those. It was amazing. And of course, not sure if it's this week or next week. It might be either. I don't know. Children in Need. That's a British institution in itself. It is another one and another amazing opportunity to perform in front of millions uh, televised and, and, and for a worthy cause, you know. So those things are, are, are very, very important, and I think that they, they make a difference in people's lives, and I think it's always a, a privilege to be able to sort of be a part of those, those amazing organizations. So you've got the Royal Variety Performance Children in Need. I never thought I'd bring this ever up in a podcast just think, we've spent 10 years not mentioning this show at all. Okay. Yeah, at all. And unfortunately, I've got to do it now. Because obviously, okay. we know what we're talking about with this. I don't think anyone yeah. else outside of the UK will know what we're, we're sort of um, referencing right. to. But you're going to have to explain to them what it is. Loose okay. Women. I knew it was coming. I knew exactly what you were going to say. In my mind, I was going to go, I bet he's going to say Loose Women. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, Loose Women is another very popular daytime talk show on, on, on UK television. And for those listeners who are not familiar with that, the easiest way for me to describe it would be the equivalent of what we have here in America is The View, yes. which is hosted by Whoopi Goldberg. And even they will say that that is their British counterpart. So they do recognize, The View recognizes Loose Women as their sort of counterpart, even though, you know, I think uh, The View does get more political in some of the conversations that they have, where loose women, I don't think they really get that deep into politics necessarily. But very, very similar. I think it's four women sitting at a, at a table discussing hot topics and, you know, current events, people in the entertainment, etc. you know. Uh, so, yes, so that would be the equivalent. So if you say Loose Women is like The View, that would be very close. So, yes, we got to perform, I think, when I was doing uh, Jersey Boys, and it might, might, might have been a few other shows that I've done. Once again, they will invite people to perform on their on the shows and stuff there. And I think uh, when I was doing Jersey Boys at the time in London, I think we performed on Loose Women. Tommy? Yes? People think I'm bonkers doing this podcast, because when on earth are you ever going to have a Death Stranding interview online <laughs> where they will mention <laughs> Loose Women? <laughs> yeah, it somehow doesn't quite go hand in hand. No, you know it really doesn't. But all your UK listeners will understand why you asked the question, and they will understand what loose women is, so they'll get it. But for everyone outside of that who may be listening, I think we did very well with explaining it, so mm. they'll have an idea. But you're right, mm. you know. Quite go hand in hand, but you were asking me about me and the things that I've done. So we did kind of pull away from DS there for a little bit. And I suppose because we've just had Remembrance Sunday, obviously we honoured the war veterans yes. that went before yes. us. Good night, sweetheart. Yes, the Yankees are coming. I think was the title of that episode that I'd done with Nicholas Lyndhurst, who was phenomenal to work with. The man is a is a genius. I had such joy working with him and Rashad Stone, who was a co-star with me. It was great. It was very funny, but it was also uh, dealing slightly with a little bit of racial tension uh, with black soldiers being in the army at that particular point in time. And I think we were coming into the pub and there was another American soldier who was more of a sort of bulldog racist type, uh, who was very good in his role, I have to say. And... Uh, there was just a little bit of tension and stuff around that. But also, Rashad's character, I think, was... Uh, I can't remember his name. I think I played Niles, and I can't remember his character's name. But he was related to someone, one of the, the, the lead characters in the show. His ancestors were related to him somehow. And it was just very funny. It was very funny. Well, obviously, you've been in a number of different projects. Which actors or actresses have been your favourites to work with and why? My favourite actress and actress? Uh, Colin Firth. Who I didn't have a great deal to do with, but I had a scene with him in which I had to say absolutely nothing. It was all about a look. But he was wonderful. It was a, a movie called Gambit, and it was him, Alan Rickman, 
and uh, I can't remember her name right now. Uh, it'll come to me. It was wonderful. I mean, he was great. Uh, How to Get Away with Murder. I'd worked with Viola Davis in a, in a, in a scene in, a, in an episode of, of her TV show. And the thing about all of these actors that I'd worked with, Ian McKellen, all these people, you watched them work, their ethic, their, uh, their talent, and yet they have all been wonderful experiences in which I felt honored to be in their presence, but equal to be in their presence and at the same time, it was always a wonderful experience. So I will count my lucky stars. I haven't had any any bad experiences with with, with uh, famous actors, and I've worked with a lot of them. That that would be the the, the sort of uh, the thing in common. They have all been really giving and as talented as well. But yeah, it's hard to sort of single one out. The only person I can probably sing out at this moment in time would be. Ian McKellen, who I found absolutely hysterical, who made me laugh. And that was only because I'd done uh, the panto with him. Uh, it was at the Old Vic, and we'd done Aladdin. And he was playing Widow Twanky, and I was the genie. And he just had this way of making you laugh, even if it wasn't meant to happen. I thought he was brilliant in it. He was very funny and uh, and charming and, and also uh, a very nice, a nice man off stage as well. Is a bit of a dangerous question. Is there anyone you would like to work with in the future? Yes. There are people that I'd like to, to work with. I'd love to work with Idris Elba, uh, Denzel Washington, Tom Hardy. Um, there's a list. There's some great British actors, um, as well as, uh, as, as American. Uh, Lee Daniels is a director I'd love to work with. Spielberg just simply out of legendaryism <laughs> uh, and, you know, being on the, on the right project. There are these people that I've grown up with their names in my head. And funny enough, here's an interesting thing. Getting to work with Lindsay Wagner, who was the original bionic woman, I was slightly starstruck with Lindsay. And I said this to her. Tadeo introduced us, uh, and I knew exactly who she was because when I grew up as a child, I had three women on my bedroom wall growing up and they were three very iconic women uh as a teenager and one was linda carter who was wonder woman the other was farrah fawcett majors who was charlie's angels and the third one was lindsey wagner who was the bionic woman and for me to at this point in my life have this moment to work with her knowing that i grew up obsessed with this woman was amazing and she was everything that I would hope that her to be, even at this stage. She's still gorgeous. She still has this amazing aura about her. She's beautiful uh, and really easy to talk to. And it was just wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Well, I'm going to give you a one-minute plug, Tommy, to plug Death Stranding. And pending any NDA involvement, anything else you've got coming up? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, listen, Death Stranding is a phenomenon. I believe it to be a masterpiece. It is a whole new genre of game. And I would employ everyone who is a gamer to go out and get this game and give it a try. Some people described it as a walking simulator, and I don't think it is that at all. Those people who did have negative things to say about it have been converted. They've come back to me going, I don't know why I thought differently. Go out. Get it. Be your own person. Make your own informed decision about it. Don't listen to what other people say, because I think that is a life lesson. I think you can take on board what people have to say about things, but ultimately, you have to make that decision. Use your own opinion and take charge of your own life and your destiny. Don't rely on what other people say. Experience it for yourself. You may come to that same conclusion, and then you may decide that you didn't. It's actually better than you could have even imagined. So I would say yes. Go out and get it, and if you want to reach out to me on Twitter, TJ84, T-E-E-J-A-Y-E-84, send me uh, a tweet and let me know what you think about it. Two things I want to say here. It has been an interesting year for you anyway, because you've had Pandora come out as well, haven't you? Correct, yes. Which has also been picked up for its second season, so that uh, will be happening, uh, which is wonderful news for the entire cast. To, to have a second season with that. It was a great experience. I was in Bulgaria for four months, 
basically working on that, and that was a great experience uh, with Mark Altman, who was the uh, one of the executive producers on it, along with Steve Prezier. It was it was amazing, mm. absolutely amazing. And the second thing, obviously, being Twitter, they did it with Detroit Become Human. I wonder if Death Stranding might, because people don't sort of just play the game, do the walkthroughs, do the reviews, do the podcasts. Hello, they do fan art as well. Yes. They do, which I have received a ton of, which is amazing. I think for a, a lot of the characters, you know, whether they're designing their own version of the of a poster or a character or you know a scene that they really enjoyed from a from a, a trailer, it's constant, and it's not something I think that is done lightly. I think they've taken their time with it and they've really put a lot of work and effort into it. I mean, I've received so many versions of of, of my character that people have sent and i'm just amazed at the amount of of detail that they put into it some of it is incredible absolutely incredible and of course i've got to say this <laughs> sorry because it's coming i'll tell you now it's coming because obviously it wouldn't have come in the event you and troy and and Lindsay were at post release right. now you would imagine yes. that there's going to be a few people who are going to dress up as your character in in cons <laughs> of course there was one guy who sort of uh, sent me an Instagram picture. He already is a Die Hardman fan, and so he's already, you know, does his cosplay and everything. And he's, you know, he's got a mask. He's kind of created the the, the outfit, and I I guarantee that there will be now that it's out and it's, uh, you know, all for all to see. There will be several Die Hardman uh, cosplay people out there. Just remember, you heard it on this podcast first. <laughs> I warned you, I warned you, Tommy, that, that, that this is going to happen. You're going to go to a convention and people are going to yeah. ask you to sign their sleeves for the PS4 games and all that stuff. And there's going to be seven of them. There's going to be seven Die Hardmans. Die Hardmans, exactly. <laughs> in a queue. And probably looking better than I do. You never know. Some of them go to that extra mile. You never know. You never know. I love the enthusiasm, though. I love that people get that enthusiastic about, you know, something that they're passionate about. Well, Tommy, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you very much. Obviously, we've got to get you back. Oh, by all means, reach out to me, and uh, I'd be more than happy to to follow up and <laughs> see where uh, where everything has gone uh, from this point. Yeah, keep you posted. Uh, the Game Awards is coming up in December next month, so I have no idea what's going to happen with that, but uh, I will definitely be attending, so hopefully there will be something for DS during that. Well, thanks very much for your time, Tommy. Absolutely, my friend. Thank you very much. Have a great day. All right, mate. Thanks very much for your time. Bye-bye. Bye.